I want to invite you tonight to open in your Old Testament to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. We'll spend some time at the end of that chapter and the beginning of the next, uh, chapter 50 as well, uh, kind of as our study for this evening. Um, if there's one thing I can say without fear of successful contradiction, it's that there are times in the lives of each of us when we get what we usually refer to as, you know, the, the short end of the stick, uh, when we're wronged in some way. And it's hard not to allow situations like that to have an effect on our attitude, on who we are. And if it happens enough, it is easy for us to become hardened. It is easy for us to become cynical. And the truth is, I don't know that anybody has, who has ever lived, except maybe for the Lord himself, uh, has had more of a reason to be bitter and resentful than did Joseph, the son of Jacob. Joseph had many reasons to be bitter and resentful, and yet when we read the account that's given to us, he wasn't. Instead, the life of Joseph demonstrates for us that a life of character is possible even in the midst of difficult circumstances, and he went through uh, many different difficult circumstances. And what his life teaches us is that if our heart is right before God, then our attitude can be right toward life, regardless of what life may bring to us. And so Joseph, when you read the, the text, he, he wasn't a victim of his circumstances. He was a victor despite them. And we can learn to live that same way, not as victims of the inequities and injustices of life, but rather to live above those things. And so what I'd like for us to do this evening is just see that Joseph had what I'm going to call a faith for all times. And as we do that, <clears throat> we're going to look at how he dealt with the past and how he dealt with what was the present for him and, and even the future. And so Joseph was faithful, we're going to see, with regard to the past. Let's talk about that first. And one thing you can say is that although Joseph held a, a powerful position in the Egyptian government, he never forgot who he was. He never forgot that he was a Hebrew. And the reason I say that is because of the way he handled the death of his father. And so let's, uh, let's read a little bit, beginning in <clears throat> actually verse 28 of chapter 49. It says, All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each, of, uh, each with the blessing suitable to him. And then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people, Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field at Machpelah, to the east of Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron, uh, Ephron the Hittite, to possess as a burying place. And there they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife, and there they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites." And when Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. And then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And so the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. And when the days for weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I'm about to die. Uh, I'm about to die in my tomb that I, I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. And now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father. Then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father, as he made you swear. And so Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, <clears throat> their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company, it says. When you look at what is said about the, the death of Jacob and everything that's associated with it, it's obvious that the Egyptians had a great deal of respect for Joseph and perhaps even for Jacob as well. Joseph had had a tremendous impact on that nation, and the Egyptians respected him because of that. And I suspect that's why they gave Jacob what amounted to, on this occasion, really the, the royal treatment following his death. 
We're told in verse 3 that the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. And if what I've read is correct, that's just a couple of days short of what they would have done had he been Pharaoh himself. I think it was 72 days for Pharaoh. And so that's the way they communicated, the great respect that they had come to have for Joseph, certainly, but also possibly for Jacob as well. And so Jacob was undergoing the process of embalming for 40 of those 70 days. We're used to hearing about that Egyptian process, process of embalming. We usually refer to it by a different name. We call it mummification, and that's apparently what they did with Jacob. Uh, it's a little further indication of the kind of standing that, that Joseph would have had, and therefore his family would have had in Egypt at this time. You didn't do that with just common folks. That wasn't, you know, everybody didn't get uh, that sort of treatment in Egypt. And I'm not sure, you know, what they did with the common people, but mummification was for the nobility, for people who were important. And on top of that, the people who were undertaking this task, no, no pun intended, uh, appear to have been Joseph's own personal physicians. We're told in verse 2 that Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father Israel. And it doesn't seem that these servants were merely on loan. They are, they are his. They are, they are at his service. And once this process of embalming was completed and the remaining days for mourning were completed, uh, also Joseph went about carrying through with his father's dying wish. That is, I want to be buried or I demand to be buried in Canaan. But even then the Egyptians honored him. What we have in this text is really the grandest state funeral recorded in all of the pages of the Bible. There's not another like it in Scripture. As someone has said, Jacob was laid to rest with all the pomp and ceremony that Egypt could muster. Again, all of this was a testimony to the respect of the people of Egypt, certainly for Joseph, but possibly also for Jacob. And how could you not love a nation that regards you that highly but what I want you to see is that in spite of all of the respect that he received from the Egyptians, Joseph was still a Hebrew at heart. Uh, he, he, was still, he, he still understood who he was. And no matter how well he and how, how well his family were treated, that, that was never going to change. And, and I suppose Joseph could have done almost anything he wanted to do for his father, short of burying him in the Valley of the Kings. He may not have been able to pull off something like that, but he could have obtained one of the finest burials known to man for his father in Egypt. And instead, what he did is he took Jacob at his request and he buried him in a cave in Canaan. And Joseph could have thought to himself, why would we go all the way there? Why would we travel all that way? We have the finest accommodations in Egypt. We have, we have arrived now. This is a place where we are honored and where, where there is respect. And, and let's, just, let's just do it here. We can forget about that old cave now. We have the opportunity to really make something out of this family here. And he could have simply pacified his father. Did whatever he wanted to following his death. His brothers wouldn't have stomped him. He was too powerful for that. But Joseph didn't do it. He honored the promise he had made to his father. And when he did that, Joseph made a statement. His actions stated that the future of his family is not going to be found in Egypt. That's not it. Even a place where because of him he enjoyed power and they enjoyed power and prestige and possessions, all of those things. But their future was in Canaan where all they had, all they had was a field that contained a burial cave and a promise that was made by God to Abraham, Joseph's great-grandfather. That's all they had. Now that last part's pretty good when God's given you a promise, but that's all they had at this point. I don't know if you've ever thought about it or not, but the request that Joseph made to Pharaoh, this request to take his father back to Canaan for burial, it's kind of a little bit of a delicate situation. Joseph had lived in Egypt for a long time. He no doubt wore their clothing and he looked somewhat like them. He had even attained an exalted position in their government. But when he requested permission to take his father back to Canaan, he was basically saying, we don't belong here. He was a Hebrew. More than that, he was a servant of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he was faithful with regard to the past. But also want you to see that he was faithful with regard to the present, or in the present, I guess is a better way of saying that. And what I mean by that is that he wasn't a different kind of person when his father died than he was when his father was still alive. And especially so with regard to, to his brothers. And so look at, look at verse 15 of chapter 50 with me for a moment. 
It says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. And so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive their transgression or please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph uh, wept when they spoke to him and his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. You know, once Jacob had died, Joseph's brothers, they, they began to wonder, you know, what is, what is this going to mean for us? And their thinking went something like this. What, what if Joseph has been putting up with us merely for the sake of our father? And, and now that he's gone, what, what do you think he's going to do with us? After all, we did some pretty lousy things to him. And what if he still holds a, holds a grudge against us? What's he going to do? And, and truth is, they had done some pretty lousy things to Joseph. They didn't like the fact that he was their father's favorite or the fact that he had a dream indicating that they, in essence, would become subservient to him. And some of them even wanted to kill him, if you recall. But they decided to sell him to the Ishmaelites. And that's how he got to Egypt in the first place. He wasn't in a position of power at that point. In fact, he was, he was at the very bottom of that society. But at this point, he is a high-ranking official when his family comes to him in Egypt. And it you know, hadn't always been that way. But because of them, Joseph had gone through some extremely difficult times. And what I think our text illustrates for us is the enduring power of guilt. I mean, I think that's what we see here and the fear that that produces. You know, there are families today that are, that are a lot like this family, still dealing with issues that were supposedly settled years ago. And the devil is so crafty in his use of guilt and the fear that that produces that, that families become basically dysfunctional. You see it all the time in our society. Some people don't trust in, in, the, in the sincerity of their family members and the entire family suffers because of that. And all that sort of thing still goes on today. Have you ever wondered what, why Joseph wept when, you know, he, these messengers come to him with this with what his brothers said, reminding him of the fact that his father had implored him to forgive them for the wrong that they had done. In verse 16, again, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And we're not told why he wept when that happened, but it could it be because they believed that he was the kind of person who was now going to take revenge for what they had done to him all those years before? He had no intention of doing that. He faced the present situation with the faith that they evidently could not, uh, could not understand, could not comprehend. And so Joseph began to weep when he realized that his brothers had evidently been doubting his sincerity for years. I don't know how long they had been in Egypt at this point exactly, but it seems to me we're going on about two decades at this point, fairly close you know, one way or another, since his family first showed up in Egypt. And nothing hurts quite like the people you love thinking the worst about you. And that upset him. And so for all of those years, he had done nothing but show his brothers kindness and goodness while all the time they had been apparently thinking, I'll bet he's just waiting and treating us this way until our father is no longer around. And as soon as he's gone, he's going to let us have it. And they'd been recipients of his love. They didn't really trust him. They had attributed to him the same vengeful disposition that had been their own. And I tell you, people still do that kind of thing today. You know, one of our fleshly tendencies is to suspect that other people are at least as bad as we are and probably worse, right? I mean, isn't that how we view things a lot of times? And, and so we just go ahead and ascribe to them that disposition. And maybe Joseph's brothers thought, again, Joseph still has to be angry with us because if he had done to us what we had done to him, I promise we would still be carrying a grudge. You know, said more about them than it said about Joseph. That's how people are sometimes. But I want you to notice the kind of faith that Joseph demonstrated in this situation. He, he didn't minimize what his brothers had done. He didn't do that at all. But he did recognize that there was a higher plan being worked out and the things that happened. And he knew that God was the one who was ultimately in control 
and that there was a reason why things had turned out this way. He talks about that there in verse 18. And he tells them, you know, behold, uh, let's see, his brothers came to him, they fell down before him, behold, we are your servants. And Joseph says to them, do not fear, for I, am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. That's why we're all here. We, we all survived that great famine, and here's the reason why, because God worked all of this out. And so Joseph could have used this situation to get back at his brothers. He could have done that if he wanted to, but he didn't. And he didn't minimize what they had done. Again, you meant evil against me. That, that is the truth. But Joseph chose not to focus on that aspect of things. He recognized that while their plan was malicious, there was another plan that was even greater that was being worked out. He knew God was in control. Uh, when you go back in the story a little bit, back to, to chapter 37, do you, do you remember the, the dreams that, that Joseph, or the dream that Joseph had, uh, actually had more than one, uh, that were partly responsible for his brothers wanting to get rid of him in the first place? He basically told them at one point that, you know, you're going to be my servants. So you go back to Genesis chapter 37, and if you start reading in verse 5, it says, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. They already hated him, but here even more. And he said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf rose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? And so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Down in verse 19. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And then they will say, or, and then they will say that a fierce animal has devoured him. And we will see what will become of his dreams. That's the, that's the attitude that they had in all of this. And I'm just going to tell you, have you ever thought about the fact that what we're seeing here at the end of the book of Genesis is the very fulfillment of the things that Joseph dreamed about? I mean, his brothers come in verse 18. And what do they do? brothers also came and fell down before him and said, we are your servants. That's what that dream was all about. And don't you know that Joseph could have had fun at their expense with this? You know, this reminds me of something. I had a dream a long time ago, and let me, let me remind you guys. I mean, he didn't do any of that. He could have made their lives miserable, and he chose not to. And instead of doing that, I like what it says there in, in Genesis 50 and verse 21. It says, he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Can I just tell you something? We've lost that in our world today. Nobody, it seems, takes that approach anymore. You've got to dig at people. You've got to, and whatever, I mean, you know, you can't take any kind of insult. You've got to give it back, and you've got to give it back twice as, as much. And that's the kind of world we live in, but that's not the will of the God that we serve. And the reason that Jacob or that uh, Joseph did what he did was because he recognized that while his brothers intended nothing more than harm, God used it for good. The Lord turned their sin into a blessing. And what we learn from all of this is that the antidote for a bitter heart it is to have a better faith. That's what it is. We have such a tendency to become so focused on the wrongs that we've suffered that I suspect we don't take time to consider what the Lord might be trying to accomplish with our circumstances. And I get that we don't, it's not like we have revelation that tells us, you know, here's why you're suffering or here's why this is happening. We don't have that. You know, we don't have to excuse sin. I'm not saying that. Joseph didn't excuse sin. But if we intend to keep ourselves from getting bitter, we need to be able to see God's hand at work in our lives. That we serve a God who works for good for those who love him, as Paul would say in Romans 8 and verse 28. And perhaps he is using our circumstances and whatever we are facing to bring about his purposes. And we need to consider that. And then the final thing I want you to see this evening is that Joseph was also faithful with regard to the future. Even in death, he displayed a tremendous amount of faith in God. Look, go back to our text there in, uh, in Genesis chapter 50. Let's start reading in verse 22. And so Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, and the children also of Maker, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you 
and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and, will carry up, and, and, uh, and you, will, you, shall, you shall carry up my bones from here. And so Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. The end of the book of Genesis. You see, by the time Joseph died, the Israelites had been in Egypt about 70 years or so, seven decades they were growing, they were increasing in every way. And the entire family was there. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if they thought of, of that the, the idea of leaving Egypt, I wouldn't be surprised if that seemed maybe more and more unlikely by the day. I mean, we've been here 70 years at this point. And we, it's been a pretty good ride, so to speak. But the promises that God made to Abraham and to his descendants, they didn't pertain to Egypt. They pertained to Canaan. And Joseph never forgot that. He was faithful with regard to the future. The Hebrew writer would say in Hebrews 11 and verse 22 that by faith Joseph at the end of his life made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. That's exactly what he did. He did that by faith. And this was a testimony to the rest of the family. Egypt is not our home. I don't believe the, the faith of Joseph, Joseph was merely a testimony to those who, who lived when times were good. I mean, we've got it good now, but I want to, I want to tell you that, that this isn't where it's at. Ultimately, it would have been a testimony when things went south, too. You get into the book of Exodus, and you, you find that it wasn't very long before there was a pharaoh who arose who, who didn't know Joseph. And we know that story. Things went downhill quickly. And when the Israelites began to be mistreated and when they were enslaved, the faith of Joseph should have served as a testimony to the fact that there is something better that awaits us as a people. Because before he died, he would say there again in verse 24, God will visit you. And that wasn't just like he's going to swing by and say hi. It, visiting in, in Scripture is visiting with the purpose of helping. God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And one of the great reminders of that fact was a coffin in Egypt that was ready to go when the time was right. What a statement that made. Let me ask you, do you have the kind of faith that we see in Joseph? Do you trust that the Lord is ultimately in control? Do you recognize that he has a plan for each of us? I don't mean like some individualized plan or, you know, can like, I get weird with that sometimes, but that's not what I'm talking about. Do we recognize that we have a future? If you do, if we do, and it should help us not to be overcome and not to be consumed by the injustices and the inequities that we face in this life. They're going to come. That's just part of living in this world. And for those who choose to be faithful to the Lord, they're going to come because of that. The question for us is this. Will we put our faith in God? Will we trust him? Will we let him lead the way? And we'll just be his people and we'll be the kind of people he's called us to be. You never committed yourself to serving him. Will you do that today? Will you obey the gospel of Christ, become an heir of the promise that he made to Abraham? That's ultimately what it is. And you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's what God is trying to accomplish. We are here today for that reason. Do you owe some other duty to God? Let us, let us help you make that right. So in whatever way we can help you this evening, we ask you to come as we stand and as we sing.